2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 14 this morning. Follow along with me as I read, starting at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in, the, in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Heavy, heavy passage. And yet, there is a wonderful ray of hope in this passage as well. But we have a tendency, don't we, as people that are drawn to the negative, to be drawn to the negative. Amen? You know what I'm saying? Why is it that every time we turn on the news, it's all about everything negative? Very seldom is about anything positive. Uh, For instance, this last uh, just a little over a week ago, in a small community in Oregon, a gunman walked into a college classroom and in cold blood killed nine people. Of course, it isn't the first time that this type of thing has happened in our country, and unfortunately, I don't think it'll be the last time. Mass shootings are, are common for us, and we're glued to to the television or the internet or whatever to, to soak in this negative stuff. But it's reality, right? This past Friday, there was a report out of Syria that ISIS crucified four Christian missionaries and beheaded eight others. Again, it's, it's one of those things that we hear on a regular basis now. Hundreds of women in that area of the world are committing suicide rather than becoming sex slaves to ISIS. You might not hear about that much, but it's there. Check it out. Negative. Yesterday in Turkey, a suicide bomber walked into a public demonstration and detonated the bombs on their bodies, killing 95 people and injuring hundreds of others. So it's not just a United States thing. It's not just an American thing. This is all over the world, this kind of negative bombardment of evil. And these are just a few things. It's constant. And you know what I'm talking about. It's constant. Every day we hear about some of this stuff. And the problem is, for most of us, it's not shocking anymore. It's lost the shock value because it's become so normal. In fact, sometimes we, we, we don't even want to hear it because it is such a typical thing, right? Our world is full of evil. And, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And our leaders stand up and say, well, the solution to all of these things is to create more law, laws. Or, or we need to dialogue more effectively. Or what we need to do is is we need to create uh, uh, ways in which to eliminate poverty. That's why all this stuff is there. Many times, I don't know about you, but I look at the situation and go, wow, what on earth is going on? 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4. Let me read this for you. Listen, listen very carefully. The Apostle Paul was writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. 
They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Then verse 13 says, But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like the day and age that we live in? I mean, Paul, 2,000 years ago, is describing what we are living. And notice what he said as he started this, this address out to Timothy. He said, in the last days, there will be very difficult times. In, in our last study together a couple of weeks ago, because we had uh, Fabian Liu was here last week, and so it's been a couple of weeks since we've back in, been back into Second Peter, so I want to review or remind you of a couple of things. We, we talked about this idea of last days, and we, we talked about the idea that Jesus talked about, <clears throat> in many occasions, uh, a last day. We see that in John chapter 6, four different times in that chapter alone. He talks about the last day, singular. And then there's other places in the New Testament that talks about the last days, like Peter does here, like Paul did in Timothy, plural, last days. So last days, last days day. And we talked about what, what, is, what is going on here. Well, last days are those days leading up to the last day, right? Does that make sense? We talked about that. And the, what are those? Well, last days from a biblical standpoint are any days from the time of Jesus's ascension until the time of his second coming. Those are called the last days of time, if you would. And there will be a last day. And we talked about the idea that time uh, was created by God. God is outside of time, right? And so there will be a day, a last time period, a last day. And so those days leading up are called the last days, and we get some descriptions throughout Scripture of what it will look like in those last days. And Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and in Mark chapter 13, he talked about what it will be on the last days, and he talked about what it will be like, and he described it like like a woman giving birth, and she's in in, in labor pains. It, it comes, it begins uh, kind of, here's one, and then there's a long period of time, and here's another one, and there's a long, but as you get closer and closer to the birth, they speed up, and those pains start coming closer and closer together, right? And that's the picture that Jesus wanted to give. In the last days, these things will come, and they'll start off like this, and then as we get closer and closer to the last day, they start coming quicker and quicker. That's the picture. And so, when we get here to 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter starts off this chapter and he, he talks about some things that they, they needed to remember in these last days. If you remember in, in verse 3, he says, now know this first of all, that in the last days, so we know that's what he's talking about. And when we went through this, we said that there was kind of a checklist almost that, that he was making here. He, he tells them in verse 1 through 4, remember the word. Remember the word. God's word is going to be very important in the last days. Verses 5 through 7 kind of a sums it up as remembering God's work. And we look close at that. He made the world. He judged the world. Peter makes reference to the flood. And he will judge the world. Judgment is coming in the future, right? And then that last part of the checklist was remember God's ways. And this was really important because in verse 8, remember, look back there with me. He says, let... Uh, do not let this one fa- uh, fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. And we talked about what that meant. Went, oh, wow, a day is a thousand years to God. That No, no, no. The key word is like. Like is the key word. This is a simile. In other words, he's trying to give us an idea by giving us something to compare it to because we only know time. But what he's saying is that God's outside of time. So so days and years, eons, mean nothing to God because he's not stuck in time. He is a holy God who is outside of time. 
And any time we take God and we try to pull him into our concept of, of, of a man of time, then we are making God in our own image. You realize that? And we have to be very careful because we already know from the commandments, right? You shall have what? No other gods before me. When I begin to make God in my own image, guess what I'm doing? I'm making my own God. And so Peter's trying to be very careful here and he's saying, look, we have a, a holy God who's above and beyond us. He's not stuck in time. These mockers in the last days, he said, they're going to come along and say, where's the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers died, he hasn't come. Everything just keeps going on like it is. And so Peter says, hey, you, rem you better remember God's ways. He's infinitely holy. He's way above us. You can't pull him down and think he's going to act like we do. That's what he's saying here. And then in verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to become to repentance. And this is beautiful, because what Peter is saying here is that God is amazingly patient. You say, oh, where's Jesus? They said he's going to come, and everybody's been dying, and life goes on, and where is he at? And Peter's basically saying, well, you better be glad he hasn't come. You better be glad he's amazingly patient. You better be glad that he's not willing that anyone perish, but all should come to repentance. That's why he's delaying, is what he's saying. Because this God has a, an amazing desire to see people come to him. But God's patience has limits. And that's verse 10. Verse 10 says... But God is, he's a patient God. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But if I were you and you have your own Bible this morning, I would circle that but. That but is a big but. And you know how it is with big buts. You just can't miss a big but. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that is a big but. That is telling us that God's patience has limits. Because here's the deal. God has to be God. God cannot be anything other than God. Does that make sense? So what that means is that God is just. He can't be anything but just. Which means sin has to be punished. You will either be punished for your sin or you'll accept the punishment that Jesus took for you for your sin. But one way or the other, because God is just and he can't be anything but God, he has to judge sin. And so while he is extending and patient and not willing that any should perish, there will come an end. There will be a last day. And Peter says here, but the day of the Lord will come. Now let me, real quick, and this isn't in your notes if you want to jot this down, day of the Lord. You go, oh, I've heard that before. What is that? Well, there's two ideas in scripture on the day of the Lord. There's a general day of the Lord. We find that mainly in the Old Testament where the day of the Lord many times in the Old Testament is a general reference to the idea that God judges the wicked, that he's going to bring judgment. For instance, the flood would be considered a day of the Lord. It was a time of God's judgment. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah would be another one. A time of God's judgment would be considered the day of, kind of a general sense. Whenever you see the day of the Lord, it's always linked to God's judgment, either in a general sense or, here's the second part, a specific final judgment. That's what Peter's talking about here. He's talking about what Jesus referred to as the last day, the it, the end right? Judgment will come. And I want to show you this morning, we're going to look at two ideas, and they're pretty plain, and you may have already picked up on this. We're just going to make it as simple as we can, but I want to give you, first of all, what Peter's talking here, a description, a description of this coming 
day of the Lord. Here's number one. The day of the Lord will be sure. It's a sure thing. Look what he says. But the day of the Lord, what? Will come. The day of the Lord will come. Now, I'm not sure because I keep losing track of it. Somebody in here who keeps up on this stuff will know. We've had something like 13 named storms this year. Am I, am I right? Is it somewhere around there? Um, 14? Somebody said 14? It's a lot. I don't ever remember. lived here over 20 years now. I don't ever remember that many uh, in, in the 20 years that I've been here. And, and they do this deal. You know, if you're watching the news or you're on the internet, you know, you, you see they show you where the, the, the storm starts, kind of where it's birthed, right? And then they track it through where it's at that day. But then they have, then they have this other line that shows you where they think it might go. And sometimes there's two, three, four lines, because they punch all this information in the computer, right? And they say, well, our, our computer images indicate that the storm could go this way. Or it might go this way. Or it could go this way. And the cool thing about it is with all these storms, none of them have hit us yet. Isn't that great? A couple of them, you know, back a couple of months ago, they looked like they were coming. There was one especially it was like, oh, it's go we're going to get hit. Molokai is going to get hit. And, and then just like a couple of days before, it does this little turn and goes this way. And we go, Shoo. right? But they tell us. They get us all worked up. Oh, you better go to the store. You better get your water. You better get your canned goods. You better make sure your generator is ready to go. And, oh, 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 oh. and then it goes, and it's almost like, oh, darn, another hit. Um, <laughs> But, but the reality is they, they don't know. It looks like maybe. But the computer-generated deal, you know, shows us possibilities, but it doesn't give us the real thing. Let me, let me tell you something. When it comes to the day of the Lord, there's no maybe about it. There's no computer-generated. Well, we think he might. He could. He may. No. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to get, well, I wonder if it's really, no, 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 no. If, if the Bible said that Jesus would come the first time and he did, right, that points to the reality of the validity that his promises are true and that he will come to judge. Peter said it's a sure deal. The day of the Lord is a sure thing. There's nothing that's going to subvert it. There's nothing that we can do to make it change or stop. It will come. Here's number two. He goes on. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Again, there's our word like. Circle that. He's helping us to understand what it's going to be like. It doesn't say that the day of the Lord is a thief. It says like a thief. Well, well, what does that mean? Well, would you put this down? The day of the Lord will be surprising. Not only was it, is it sure, but it's also going to be surprising. It will be unexpected. Listen to how Jesus describes it in Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44. He said this, Therefore, be on the alert, for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you don't think he will. He is coming like a thief. Many, many years ago, I had my car stolen. Not on Molokai. And the way it worked is I parked that morning in the parking lot and I worked all day and I went out after work and I had all my stuff and I was walking up to my car and where's my car? And it took me a little while because I, I never dreamed that my car would be stolen, but I finally figured out, yes, I did drive today. Yes, I did park here. My car is gone. Wow, I think my car was stolen. And you know what? It was. Dirty bugger stole my car. Now, when that happened, I didn't go, oh, shoots. I knew that was going to happen. 
should have parked in the other lot. I knew it was going to. No, no, no. I was thinking something like this. I can't believe this happened. I, I can't believe my car is good. Is it really gone? I can't believe they really stole my car. Why? Because I didn't expect it. I didn't drive in that morning and go, oh, I bet my car is going to get stolen today. That's the whole point of a thief, right? He comes when you don't expect it. That's what he's trying to get us to understand here. The day of the Lord. It's not going to be like, oh, I think it's, I think it's today. Yeah, look at the clouds. Uh, it's the day of the Lord for sure. <laughs> no, it's going to come unexpectedly. Listen to how it's described in Luke. Jesus speaking again, Luke 17. He said, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Now, I know we don't get much lightning here, but I grew up in the lightning capital of the United States. Seriously. Florida is like the lightning capital. Uh, uh, summertime, man, the sky lights up. The storms blow in off of the Atlantic, off the Gulf of Mexico, and man, we got some amazing storms when I was a kid. And when that lightning comes, it doesn't come, oh, look at the lightning, look, look at that lightning, wow, it doesn't do that. It goes, and you go, whoa, and there's another, it, it's split second, it just flashes and it's gone, there's a, there's, a, there's a lightning bolt and it's gone. It comes, sometimes it comes across the sky, and that's the picture here, man, it's going to be sudden, it's going to be quick. This is not going to be something like, Wow, the day of the Lord started three hours ago. When and when it's going to be finished? No, the point is it's like a thief. A thief steals your purse. He doesn't come over and go, mm, I don't know if I want this brand or not. No, he takes it and goes. The picture is it's going to be unexpected. It's going to be sudden. That's what he means by the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's sure it's going to come surprising. And number three, it'll be severe. The day of the Lord is severe. Verse, the end of the verse, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now, let me break this down for you a little bit. If he says the heavens will pass away, that simply means it'll be gone the way we know it right now. It's gone. If you've ever had a house burn up or a car burn up or something, something you're like, oh, what happened? Oh, burned up, man. It's gone. Thing's gone. And that's, that's the picture here. It says it will, uh, it'll pass away with a roar. Very interesting word in the original Greek. It means to make a whizzing or whistling noise. It was used to describe the noise that an arrow makes when it shot through the air. In other words, it'll be this whizzing, wild sound that will indicate that this is what's happening. A deafening kind of deal. It says the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Again, another amazing word. The word elements there in the Greek means the basic parts or components of something. The basic parts or components of something. The elements. Well, what is that? Well, of course, back in Peter's day, they didn't know anything about atoms or, or nuclear stuff, right? But even though you don't know about it, it's there. And the idea was when Peter was putting this in words through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the elements, the basic components of what makes things things is going to be destroyed with intense heat? That's pretty intense. It's hot. It's hotter than it is right now, right? Um, how's this going to happen? Somebody says, well, it sounds like nuclear bomb to me. I know what happens. Some rogue nation gets crazy and they push the button and boom, we're all gone and that's the day of the Lord. No, I don't think so. I, I do think something atomic is going on here just because of the words that describe it, but it's nothing man that does. So this is, this is not a man-made catastrophe. This is God's judgment. 
well, don't you think he could use man to bring? Yeah, he could, but then man gets some kind of twisted credit for it. This, this has got, let, let me tell you what I think, all right? This is going to take me a minute, so, so, so hold on. This will be, there was, there was one judgment before on earth. Right? You remember when that was? One, one global judgment, right? It goes back to Genesis chapter 7 with the flood. The Bible says that God flooded the entire world, right? He used water. Now, let me read you that description, all right? And then I want to talk about it for a second. And you all, oh, I know you know this. No, listen, listen now, okay? Because you think you know, but some of you don't know. Okay? And I'm going to tell you what you don't know, and then I'm going to tell you what you need to know. All right? You ready? All right, here we go. Genesis chapter, I'm going to read this out in the New Living Translation because it it just really makes it clear. All right, listen to what it says. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. You go, told you, I already knew that. No, you don't. Listen. Because I'm going to tell you now. Normally we think about this and we think, oh yeah, I got it all together. It rained. It just rained. It rained, it rained, it rained. And everybody was bored and it rained and the flood, the waters came up. No, no, no. You missed something. Look at it says again. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted from the earth. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh. I don't know a lot about this, but I've seen a little bit of it. I've been in caves on the mainland, some, you know, some of these big caves that tourists go into and stuff. and, And there's, I've seen underground rivers in these caves. I mean, you go down like a mile or so, or three quarters of a mile, and they go, look, you see that down there? It looks like water. You go, yeah, it is water. It's a river. It's an underground river. You go, wow. And they tell you about the fish that are down there. I was in one cave one time uh, in Tennessee, and it had this massive lake, and we took a boat in this cave underground on this lake. Now, that, those are just a couple of, that stuff's all underneath, right? We've got, here in Hawaii, we've got lava tubes and stuff, and, and that's what gives us our water, right? The rain comes down, it fills those things up. Those are our aquifers or whatever you call them. But now I want you to picture this. Oh, a little bit of rain, and Noah's on the boat with his umbrella. No, 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 no. The way this is described in the Hebrew, the best that we can do is what we did right there. It erupts out of the ground. Now you imagine water just shooting out of the top. Now, you see like a, a fireman. Uh, we used to have uh, the firemen come and give demonstrations to the preschool. They haven't been here in a couple years, but they come and they set up outside and they take their hose and they hook it up and they show the kids what the water looks like coming out of the fire hose, right? It's really cool. And then they let the kids hold it with the firemen. But I found out something. That thing is turned down to like, you know, out of 10, it's on a one. And it's still coming out there pretty good. I said, oh, why you do that? They said, because the kid would blow into, you know, Oahu (laughs) if we did that. Because the force and the power coming out of that thing is as the truck pumps that water through, right? And that's a man-made thing. Now imagine, God just takes his hand away and says, okay, I'm not holding the waters back anymore. Boom! They're exploding out of the ground. Say, how did we get to places like the Grand Canyon? Must have been billions and billions. No, come on. When you've got this kind of deal, this is catastrophic. This is, and then it says it come, the rain is coming down in torrents. I want you to picture the rain, the hardest rain you've ever seen. And then multiply that. I mean, and it doesn't, you know, oh, man, it's been raining hard for the last hour. Oh, look, it's letting up. That's nice. No, it doesn't work that way. It comes in torrents in these sheets for days and days and days and days. And we read in the rest of Scripture that it keeps raining for for, um, over 120 days. 
It's just this torrential rain was the first 40. So for 40 days, you've got the earth exploding in water, and you've got water coming down. You go, oh, now I see how it could fill up with water. Yeah, it wasn't a rainstorm. It was, a, it was an explosion of water that absolutely changed the earth's structure. Mountains, valleys, all kinds of stuff. And when Noah and his family got off that ark, folks, it was like stepping onto a different planet. It was like they had taken a trip to another planet somewhere else in the galaxy. When they stepped off that boat, it was not like it had been over a year earlier. It was a whole different world. Why? Because God literally cleaned it with water, wiped it clean with water. Now, you say, that's great, but I thought we were talking about the day of the Lord. We are. I want you to understand what God can do with the elements he's created just by using them for his purposes of judgment. Now, if the elements themselves are burning, the very basic things that make up stuff, we're talking about atoms. What holds that all together? Science isn't really sure. They used to call it nuclear glue. I'm not sure what they call it anymore. And you go, ooh, that sounds amazing. What's nuclear glue? Oh, we don't know. We just call it nuclear glue because we don't know what else to call it. It's whatever holds it together, right? And when you split that and you release that, we've already seen that in history. Listen to this. This was amazing when I read this. And this came off of PBS, so it must be true. If, if you could harness its power, that is, turn every one of its atoms into pure energy, the paperclip, paperclip, would yield about 18 kilotons of TNT. That's roughly the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. In Hiroshima's explosion, countless atoms of uranium were split apart in a nuclear chain reaction. Each time an atom split, the total mass of the fragments speeding apart was less than that of the original atom. The bomb, in essence, transformed three hundredths of an ounce of mass into a cataclysmic burst of heat and light. You go, I don't know what you just said, but it sounds amazing. Let me tell you what I just said. The amount of atoms that were split to do the damage that was done in Hiroshima would be equivalent to the amount of atoms in one little paper clip, and it did all that damage. Imagine every atom in the world being released at the same time. The power, the energy, the heat that would come from that. So when you start to understand it from the standpoint that God has built into creation elements that he can use for judgment, it's, it's amazing. It's staggering. And then he says the earth and its works will be burned up. What does he mean by that? The earth and its works. Everything that's ever been put together. Think about the most amazing things. You know, you see these incredible buildings and, and all this stuff that, that, that we are able to make and create. And boom, it, it'll be gone. It's all going to be burned up. It's all going to be gone. You say, well, oh, thank you so much, Randy. I appreciate the uplifting sermon today. As I go home and sit in my car that's going to be burned up in my house that's going to be burned up, lay in my bed that's going to be fried. And, you know, folks, that's the harsh reality. But Peter doesn't stop there. If he did, man, it would be a, a downer, wouldn't it? He gives us what our response should be. In those last few verses, he tells us exactly how we should respond. And I'm calling these the three ups, okay? I'm going to give you three ups of response. Here you go. Ready? Verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He says, look, if this is all going to happen, then you as followers of Jesus Christ, 
What does that mean you should be doing? You should be living holy and godly lives? He's saying, straighten up, man. Straighten up. When I was a kid and we used to do things that we weren't supposed to be doing, one of my parents, usually my dad, would say, boy, you better straighten up. Right? What did he mean? Quit doing what you're doing and start doing the right thing. And Peter says, here, look, since all these things are going to be destroyed, look, it's all going to burn up. Don't get yourself all hooked to stuff and, and materialism. And He says it's all going to be gone. So what sort of people are you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What are we living for? Is what he's saying. What are you living for? Oh, I, I'd like to get this car. You know, I'd like to get this house. I'd like to make this much money before I retire. I'd like to have this much investments in my portfolio. And he's going, look, keep balance, man. Straighten up. Live the way that God is calling you to live. Amen. Thanks, Noah. I appreciate that. <laughs> then verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. You say, what, what is he saying there? Look, he says, looking for the coming of the day of the Lord. What is that all about? Well, he, we're, we're looking for this coming and we're hastening it? How can I make it come any quicker? This is very interesting. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. He said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Do you hear what he said? He said the gospel is going to be preached and all the nations are going to be, be brought to all over the world and then the end will come. You say, what does that mean? I'm not totally sure, but what it's telling us is we need to be getting the message out. So what Peter's saying to these folks is, hey, you better straighten up. You better speak up, right? There are folks that need to know that there is a day coming where the end will come. This will not go on forever. We will not just continue to go through these cycles over and over and over and over and over again beyond infinity. It will come. Jesus said there is a last day. Uh, the apostles talked about last days leading to that last day. We have a day of the Lord. It is coming and it should cause us to go, man, what about Auntie so-and-so? What about my brother who lives somewhere who doesn't know? How about the people that I work with out there? It should be stirring us to go, man, there are people that need to know that God loves them and he's not willing that any should perish and he's actually holding things back because he's so amazingly patient. But he doesn't use skywriting. He doesn't inoculate people with some kind of, you know, angelic shot. He uses us to tell people. That's why we do hollow him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? I was so pleased to see, you know, we, we just you know, opened up the sign up for Hollow Him last week or the week before. And so many of you signed up and that's great. And we need so many more because it's going to be a, uh, we need a lot of servants. But the thing I noticed, Nohea, was that in our evangelism area, we had one person sign up. Folks, I know it's scary. I, I don't really understand why. I don't know why. It's not like, you know, it's not like you're going to share the gospel with somebody and they're going to punch you out right there. Jesus, who? You know? What? You use Jesus on me? But we, it's kind of like we had that, oh, I don't know if I can do that. That list should be full. Because nohea has got this all set up. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. Kind of. But folks... There are people dying all around us. We, we call it the good news, so why aren't we sharing it? We, do we really believe that there is going to be a day of the Lord? Do you, do you really believe that? Then what Peter's saying is, look, he, look what he says. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? In, in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord, man. Straighten up. Speak up. Number three, 
Verse 13, but according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth which righteousness dwells. There it is. There's the ray of hope. There's the burst of yay that comes into this passage. Because it's all been pretty bleak, right? Everything's melting away, burning up. It's all gone. And here's what he says. He says, but for you, remember, he's writing this letter to followers of Jesus Christ. But according to his promise, the promise that Christ gave, we, followers of Jesus, we're looking for a new heaven, a new earth. See, because if you go to Revelation 21, which we don't have time to this morning, what you see is this, this old earth is, is burned up. It's purged. That's what, that's what Peter's talking about here. And God makes something new, something amazing. No curse. In, in Revelation 21, it tells us there's no crying there, no pain, no sorrow. He's describing the eternal state. And he says, in which righteousness dwells. So, man, we look at the news and we go, when, when is it going to stop? When is this mass murder? When is this terror? When is this evil throughout the whole earth? When will it stop? It stops finally and totally at the day of the Lord, the last day. He says, that's it. It is enough. I'm done with it. And I'm going to make something so far beyond your understanding. That he doesn't even try to describe it except, like I said in Revelation 21, just giving us little glimpses. There's not going to be pain. There's not going to be the curse. There's not going to be crying. That alone, if that's all it was, it would be like, oh, yay. But it's going to be so much more than that. So much more than that. Because, folks, what Peter was trying to tell these folks in so many words is you were not created for time. You were created for eternity. And he wants to remind these folks, hey, don't forget, don't forget. There is a coming day of the Lord. There, there will be a final judgment because God is God and he has to be true to his own character and nature. He must, must punish evil. And so you will either embrace the payment, the punishment that Jesus took in your place or you will face the judgment of Almighty God. That's the bottom, serious, sober line, folks. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?